It's hardly necessary to define anger because everyone knows what it is. And nearly everyone understands it from personal experience. <clears throat> but for technical purposes, it is generally defined as an intense emotion caused by real or imaginary injury or insult. Now, in our actual daily living, we find it very easy to become angry. And it sort of develops from irritation or it becomes a temperamental habit over which we have ultimately very little control. It is wise to remember that we are always at a disadvantage the moment a negative emotion causes us to lose control of ourselves. The chances are a hundred to one that the moment we cannot control and constructively direct emotion, we're going to get ourselves into worse situations than we find at the moment. Therefore, anger, hate, rage, all of these intensities become the cause of the further development of the situations which seem to generate them. In our psychological thinking, we know that a person who has unusual proclivity toward anger is nearly always in difficulties. An emotion, especially a negative one, draws the very circumstances uh, with which it becomes most concerned. Yet we know also that it is difficult sometimes, at least, not to be emotionally disturbed. Conditions seem to pile up, and we gain the inevitable feeling that we are the victims of unfairness of some kind. And against this injury, we are inclined to develop a strong and rather dramatic attitude. Thus anger, like most of our emotions and negative thoughts, cannot be controlled merely by an energy of the will. This problem of trying to hold on to an emotion, prevent it from breaking away, trying desperately to inhibit or frustrate its expression. Such a procedure is not good or healthy. Nearly all emotional excess arises from lack of basic philosophy of life, lack of basic integrity, lack of basic organization. Wherever these emotions are strong, the central core of the individual is weak. For the whole story is one of lack of self-control. The individual is not directing his own thoughts and emotions. He is the victim of them. They surge up, whether he permits it or not, having greater strength than his own will and therefore drowning out whatever good intentions may have been present. If, is, as the uh, dictionary and other standard texts tell us, that anger is most commonly caused by injury or insult, then we could consider these two possible sources. Let us take, perhaps, the most far-reaching first. I think we can say generally that insult rather than injury is the most common cause. The average individual is not greatly injured in terms of factual uh, de debility or disablement. We very seldom have an enemy who hits us over the head with a club or something of that nature. That is a rare form 
of enemy. The kind of enemy we most generally have is the person who disagrees with us. And he is an ever-present adversary. And we really have no words strong enough to express how little we think of him. The great adversary is the one who does not see things our way. One of the greatest causes of anger in our lives is the fact that we are confronted with the decision which forces us to admit that we are wrong. This is enough to really upset the whole day. We are much more likely to feel insulted than we are to face the fact that our own attitude may have been incorrect. So we do not like people who reveal our own weaknesses to us. We do not like people who are stronger than we are, not because they are stronger, but because we are weaker. We do not like people who outwit us in various activities. We do not like people whose decisions prove to be more correct than ours in long-range survey. And most of all, we do not like people who do not think that we are exceptional. Or if we are exceptional, the wrong kind of exception. All these things have a tendency to spoil our emotional climate. We become injured, not because they have hurt us, but because we cannot face the challenge of ourselves. Uh, Socrates, of course, was the kind of man you couldn't insult because he knew more about his own faults than anyone else could possibly discover. This type of person, however, is comparatively rare and in daily experience, probably such self-analysis would not be particularly profitable. But with all of this situation, it is basically true that most of our enemies are persons who disagree with us. Therefore, that we are all confronted with the problem of trying to live in the world with persons who are not of our mind. We must gradually get over the Aristotelian classification that there is only one right, and that is our side. And then there are all kinds of wrong, which are other people's side. We also have to recover from the conviction that we are injured because others do not agree with us. We are never really injured by disagreement. We are only injured when we cannot get along with ourselves. And that problem so often arises in connection with anger. Anger also opens us immediately to a most uh, disadvantageous position. Becoming angry, we will always lose judgment. We will begin to feel instead of think, and will probably make the situation infinitely worse. The more confused we become, the more angry we will become, until we may become totally enraged at an individual who declines to lose their equilibrium and join us in the general uh, discomfiture. We all pass through these experiences and we wonder what we can do about them. Actually, there is a great deal that can be done. But so often, the best intentions fail in the moment when we need them most. We can build a wonderful philosophical attitude, but when someone is unpleasant, this attitude fails us, and we immediately react to our old atavistic 
uh, premises and compulsions. Actually, the only way we can overcome any negative condition is the gradual development of a positive core inside of ourselves, a core that becomes real. And because it is real, it cannot be lost. Anything that can slip away from us under the slightest provocation is not real. Actually, the tendency to be angry in the life of the average person is more real than his self-control. That is why he becomes angry. If self-control is more real, he will not be angry. Yet with all these evidences, that we see coming from us every day of the weaknesses of our own attitudes, the fallacies of our own conduct, we still are unwilling to face the need for self-improvement. We try to dilute the whole problem and throw it upon society. We take the attitude that if everyone else was exactly what they ought to be, then we would be all right. This is a beautiful thought, but it just is not going to happen. Therefore, we have got to be right in spite of people instead of because of them. And we cannot wait for the universal reformation of mankind before we can improve ourselves. This, in a smaller way, means that we cannot wait until our own family changes or our own friends change, or until our own employment differs from its present estate. These things have to be begun and worked through now, where we are and as we are, and in the kind of a world we are now living in. How then shall we make these internal positive statements real? One of the most available and common sources of inspiration in such matters, of course, is our religious conviction. Yet thousands of years of religious conviction have not been able to overcome the tendency to anger. Good religious people get just about as angry as anyone else. Why? Because again, they have ignored the personal equation. They have thought of religion as something they were supposed to believe and not a way they were supposed to act. Thus they substitute a belief for a code of conduct instead of causing the belief to motivate a proper code. As long as our convictions are not expressed through our conduct, we will not have any major change in our dispositional background, or foreground, for that matter. Philosophy helps. Philosophy gives us greater realization of the kind of world we live in, helps us to understand people, and most of all gives us a sense of the universal justice which must underlie the forms of injustice with which we are constantly irritated. Consequently, we can say that philosophy strengthens our ability to see past the personal and toward the impersonal. Again, however, philosophy does nothing unless it helps us to live according to the principles which it teaches. Social experience may contribute to our understanding. When we begin to realize that perpetual compromise with principles and this condition of living almost constantly in a state of emotional upheaval is simply not good. Psychology helps us because it shows us that these emotional tensions are due to ourselves and further reveals the result of them upon the integrity of our own personality. We gradually come to face a decision 
Are we going to get over these emotional stresses or do we prefer to be sick and miserable? There is no other answer. We either must get well or pay the consequences. This decision, however, has not, for the most part, changed the majority of people who have been faced with it. It is exactly like the chronic alcoholic. He knows he is killing himself. He knows he is destroying his usefulness as a citizen, that he is betraying his family, and that he is ultimately going to pay a heavy price in misery for his conduct but he still, in most instances, does not recover. He will not depart under threat of consequence. So today, uh, the threat of the negative result of action is not generally sufficient to cause a change in conduct. The person prefers to do as he pleases now. And for the most part, he pleases to give full expression to his negative instincts. Why has always been a question. But throughout history, it has been true that the negative is so old in man, going back millions of years, and the positive is so new, with only a few thousand years of background, that man is not able to balance these in his personal conduct. Also, the hope of a better state does not have the uh, allurement that it once had. The average person who is miserable today will not change simply because he was going to feel better if he does. You would think this would be a powerful inducement the self-respect of others, the improvement of his social condition, the probable improvement of his health. These positive inducements do not move him very much. Again, he is bound to the immediate reaction to pressure. He has no sense of not reacting as he feels when he feels. The answer here, of course, can only be one thing. And that is, for some reason, man, as a collective group, has never experienced the constructive result of self-discipline. We do not conceive of discipline as anything but punishment. The individual who is told that he should not do something is considered penalized. He considers himself deprived. The idea of discipline as a contribution to self-security and as a means of self-improvement has very little status with us. Discipline is a burden and a hardship. And we fear it more than we fear the consequences of undisciplined life. We hope that lack of discipline will permit us to live in a continuing state of doing what we want to now. And that sometimes, somewhere, it may catch up with us, but on the other hand, we may not last that long anyway. This All this evasion problem, uh, forms its part in this situation. Uh, foreigners coming to this country from various parts of the world, and we have had a tremendous influx of them in recent years, have all been amazed by one thing, and they have frequently mentioned it in books or articles which they have written, and that is the almost total lack of discipline which is obvious in the American way of life. Most of these par persons have come from heavily disciplined types of background, heavy family discipline, heavy political control. They have never known the peculiar freedom that we have. They am are amazed 
at the tremendous privilege which we collectively enjoy. But they also note very soon that we are not reacting to this constructively. We are using this opportunity merely as a means of gratification, not a means of integration of any particular kind. We interpret liberty as the right to do as we please, whereas there must be and always is beyond this a way that things should be done that is right. And the individual who does not cling to right must suffer. And where liberty is interpreted as the ability to do wrong without punishment, the person is in trouble. Now, there are a great many evils that cannot be punished by law, but can only be punished by their reaction within the person in terms of sickness or unhappiness. The individual who does not recognize rules governing conduct and is unwilling to live these rules must come in time to a disaster. He may realize this, but still he will not change his way. We have, however, a great, a considerable increasing number of persons who are trying sincerely to grow. And those who are really making a valiant effort should be given every possible encouragement and all available information to make their growth easier. And in this spirit, we want to analyze some of the phases of the anger problem in an effort to see through this weakness in our own organism. Now, we have people who take attitudes on this situation. We have a school of psychology which considers it important that the individual become angry once in a while. Well, I don't think they're going to have to worry too much. I don't think we need indoctrination in this direction. I think we will have enough of it, uh, regardless of any course that we pursue, to prevent total frustration. On the other hand, there is a grave question whether we do need it or not. The only reason why we need anger is because there's something wrong in us. It may be very much like the individual who needs another drink, not because he really requires it, but because his alcoholism, already established, demands it. There is very grave question as to whether nature really finds it essential for a rational creature to be angry. But because everyone else is, we assume that it is a needed emotional reaction. It probably is needed in the individual who completely lacking self-control and unable to orient anything within himself is simply cannot merely frustrate the emotion if it has reached a certain degree of dominance in the character of the person, probably he cannot restrain it. And perhaps he would become suddenly worse if he tried to. But all in all, the whole problem is a one of abnormal condition. Anger is abnormal. It is not part of the natural temperamental unfoldment of the individual. It is an extreme, and all extremes are dangerous. There is also the school that divides anger into various types. One of these is the righteous indignation group, the individual who believes that there are times and are conditions in which the individual is justified in being angry because of the circumstances themselves. That there are certain things that can happen 
and that if the individual in those situations is not angry, there's something wrong with him. We talk of righteous indignation and the wrath of God, and therefore we assume that there must be some kind of anger that is justified. I doubt it. In the first place, any problem that is so real that we are inclined to be angry at it is also a challenging problem. And what we should be looking for is solution. And usually we will delay or completely destroy solution by emotional explosion. If a problem is so real that it causes us to be angry, it is a problem big enough to cause us to roll up our sleeves and solve it. And we will never solve it merely with anger, because anger at the end will leave us weak and tired and the problem bigger than ever. So it's a grave question whether we can find one single situation in which anger or hate, or wrath, or rage, will ever make a real contribution. Sometimes people feel that a little outburst of anger will frighten somebody else into a more reasonable attitude. If we can get angry before the other fellow does, we have sort of outwitted him, and he will have to retire abashed, unable to take the full weight of this little whirlwind that we have developed in ourselves. So we have a philosophy of got mad first, and in this way discomfort the adversary, or sort of browbeat him into temporary acceptance. We also have a group in which anger seems possible in this way that knowing that a person is touching, easily irritated, and likely to explode on the slightest notice, there is a tendency to cater to such people. Don't stir them up. Whatever they want, give it to them. Save a seed. This is commonly known as capitalizing on a liability to make uh, a bad disposition profitable to some purpose that we have in mind. This is commonly done, but still is not any more right than any other negation. The individual who uses a bad disposition to control others is no different psychologically in his guilt mechanisms from the person who uses blackmail or any other wrong means of attaining a desired end. And where anger is used to exploit others, nature has a delightful punishment waiting. That is that gradually the person loses control of his ability to control his own temper fits. And little by little, the moods which he assumes become natural to him, and he ends up with a thoroughly bad disposition and all the consequences. In the end, it costs him more than he can possibly gain by these temperamental outbursts. So as we go down the line, we find very little actual constructive result. Now, in the course of working with folks, we have a great many people who come in who have had long and difficult feuds. Many of these have lasted for a lifetime. Sometimes they are bequeathed unto our issue as a heritage. We are supposed to hate the relatives our ancestors didn't like. This situation of bad blood in the life of the individual is usually unfolded in great detail as an explanation for all kinds of misfortunes. The person is 
telling us how they have suffered, how they have been forced to desperation, and all the horrible things that other folks have done to them. But what they always forget to do is to tell us what they did to the other folks. And once in a while, situations line up so that we do get both sides. And I assure you, there are nearly always two sides. And the person who has gradually permitted himself to cultivate negative attitudes has become a terrible problem for other people. And therefore, by degrees, fulfills for himself all of the negative fears that were once only imaginary. But in time, he can make them happen if he nurses them lovingly enough. All these things point out that we need some basic philosophy, some basic integrity with which to combat our more common human instincts. As I've said, uh, religion could help, but it generally doesn't because we will not apply it. We will accept it, we will talk about it, we will try to convert other people to it, but we will not sit down to the quiet daily process of living it. There isn't enough glamour involved. Also, when we do live it, we usually come upon a minor crisis. For the moment we change our ways, everyone is duly astonished, and some folks won't believe it. So usually we do have a short period of difficulty, and that most often discourages the would-be self-reformer because he does not come into peace and happiness in 24 hours, he gives it up as a bad job. He never really wanted to do it anyway, as one told me. And this uh, modified incentive cannot produce great effect. So in problem of anger, we have to, we have to sort of rationalize one of the simplest methods of of uh, handling the problem is through the delayed reaction. The power of anger is usually summarized in an outburst. If any method can be devised to delay the uh, outburst, it will usually disintegrate. If you can even count the proverbial ten before you get angry, you've already reduced the probability 50%. And if you can make it to 100, you're practically in the clear. Because in order to be thoroughly angry, you must not think. And anything that gives you an, ep an interlude for thoughtfulness, in which you are not too greatly plagued by this emotional intensity, will do a great deal of good. I know people who have been very successful they, in this respect, that whenever they have been moved to react negatively against anyone, whenever they've heard a bit of gossip and they've decided to tell somebody what they think, or whenever they are convinced that they have been the victim of an injustice and they're just going to move, move right in and clear it up, these people who have followed a simple formula, namely the 24-hour breather, have succeeded very well in coping with the situation. Uh, perhaps you have noticed in the international affairs that nearly always great changes come very suddenly. We remember the Depression. 1929, a few days before the Depression, we were assured that the financial condition of the country was never better, that we had nothing to look forward to but prosperity. Crash. <laughs> now, since that time, we have had several very long periods of anxiety about depression, worrying about it wondering whether it was going to happen or not. It didn't. 
The reason being that if you allow enough time, the intensities which cause violent actions wear off, and the violent action is much less likely to occur. Same thing with war. If there is a three months agitation, there'll be no war. But if the war hits within 24 hours of the first insult, you will have war, but not if you wait. Because by the time you wait long enough, everyone talks themselves out of action. Also, somebody does a little rationalizing somewhere in the picture. It begins to figure how expensive it's going to be. Or perhaps they are going to lose. And that gives caution. So the great emotional changes and outbursts must be quick. For if we consider them, they evaporate. And that has been the example of history for a very long time. And it is the same thing with individuals. I've known persons who are going to sit down and write that letter and tell someone just what kind of a heel they really were. They waited for 24 hours. The letter was never written. Because by that time, that character, that particular heel had slipped into the background. There was another one that had appeared since. <laughs> there was a new crisis. For people who have that attitude are in a state of perpetual crisis anyway. And, of course, in many instances, a great a harm was saved, inasmuch as the person who was to receive the letter may not really have been nearly as much of a heel as they were supposed to be. And in checking these cases, we find that the reason why Mr. Jones believed that his friend needed the letter in the first place was because his friend wouldn't loan him money. And the friend had already loaned him money and never gotten it back. So there was a whole series of causes back of this thing. And the great thing that makes heels out of people is that they do not do what we want them to, whether we are right or wrong. So if we will allow the 24-hour cool-off, most anger will have a tendency uh, to subside. Now, another type of anger, which is uh, rather difficult, is the anger that is due to fatigue. And this is quite common in families, and particularly in the relation of parents to very boisterous and animated children who are enough to wear the body and mind to exhaustion. There's nothing really wrong with the children except we are a little envious of the fact that they have so much more vitality than we do. And they seem to be building theirs at the expense of ours. <laughs> so in the moment of fatigue, we get angry. And we say something or we do something. Now if the parent is essentially, basically well-adjusted, the minor outbursts that come from fatigue or exhaustion are seldom very detrimental in their results. I've never been able to find that children were really damaged by that rare outburst of an exasperated parent because children are also subconsciously far more intelligent than we realize. They know of how difficult they can be, whether they're admitting it or not. And they are seldom, if ever, psychologically injured by a legitimate reprimand of any kind. They are far more injured by not being disciplined at all. So if the parent is basically fair and honest, and has a good, solid consciousness of values, the occasional, occasional slip away into excess will not be seriously detrimental. It is where the parent is basically neurotic, has basically a critical disposition, and therefore puts too much weight upon these outbursts, has them too frequently, 
and frequently allows them to arise over situations that do not justify them, or in haste have condemned or criticized a child for an action which that child did not perform. Where there is injustice or an unreasonable attitude which offends the child's basic sense of right, then you will have trouble. And this is true to a great degree in life also. The average person who is well-oriented, it may well be that anger is no asset, but it will be forgiven if it is under tremendous provocation. But the individual who is angry continuously without adequate provocation is a nuisance and will always be so. The moment we find a dissatisfaction which seems to be real, we have the power of doing something about it. The thing that does the least good is to get mad. For during the period of anger, no solution or program can be devised that means anything. Wherever there is something that displeases us, here is a demand upon our positive mental and emotional resources. We grow through meeting adversity, through solving difficulty. We do not grow by simply being mad at anything. If, however, there is a situation, we have an opportunity to use it as a valuable experience text following the Pythagorean discipline of uh, sort of a retrospective analysis of life, we can sit down and we can say to ourselves, I've been more edgy recently than is good for me. I'm having more people around me I don't like. I'm more critical of the way everyone acts. And I find a tendency to have these people stay away. My social life is falling apart. What is wrong with me? This is the beginning of analysis, the beginning of consideration. Now, there are many things we may find. One may be simple fatigue. If fatigue is the cause, then we must find ways of solving this problem. And one of the ways always to solve fatigue problem is to conserve energy. Because we are tired, because our energy is not equivalent to our need, or we have a high toxic rate that is making our energy unavailable to us. Negative thoughts and emotions are the principal cause of toxicity and the principal cause of fatigue. Today, the person who is physically overworked is in the hopeless minority, not one in a hundred, but the individual who is wearing himself out mentally and emotionally over his work, his name is Legion. Almost everyone is in this predicament. So if the fatigue factor is there, all the more reason why there shall be no time lost and no energy wasted in irritation or it is going to make the fatigue worse. If we find through a certain amount of analysis that this tendency to get angry easily has always been with us, and we know that we come by it honestly because we had an uncle who had temper fits, or we had a grandmother who had spasms, we know that we come honestly by this emotion. And because we come honestly by it, we regard it as inevitable and set back and settle down to enduring it. That is no answer either. There is no inevitable necessity for a bad disposition. But if we have long cultivated it and it's just gotten a little worse by degrees because of habitual repetition, then we better sit down and do something about it quick because it will ultimately wreck our lives and destroy us. So we also observe as we go along 
that we are functioning according to a little pattern of likes and dislikes. Most persons have built out of their own experience and their own reflections about it a private universe, a universe in which they are the principal citizen, the supreme autocrat, and the more or less cosmic lawmaker. In this universe, which is invisible, because if it was visible, we couldn't stand it ourselves. In this universe, everything is the way we demand it to be. It is a kind of hidden world. When anything goes wrong, we retire into it. And if anyone comes out with any remark or thought contrary to this private autocracy of ours, we suffer from what is called righteous indignation. Well, we have to begin to look over this private universe. And we find that very much like the alcoholic or the narcotic addict or individuals uh, addicted to gluttony or almost any other excess, that our private motivation in living is largely one of negation. The individual today like a highly toxic uh, sufferer from health, is really living on his irritation rather than his energy. If he ever found himself in a quiet frame of mind, he would think he was dying. <laughs> feel a total collapse creeping over him. He hasn't relaxed for so long that the experience would be unbelievable and very dangerous as far as his own diagnosis is concerned. But having these values, what have we got inside of us? Something that we must, by a sense of loyalty, defend against other people. And we study these folks, and I've worked with a great many of them. Why are they angry? Why are they upset? Why are they miserable? Well, a whole group of them, a certain, every four years, are totally miserable and mad because the wrong individual is elected president. <laughs> if someone else got in, there would be an equal number because this other person would be the wrong one. Then there are individuals who cannot pick up the morning paper without getting mad at something, perhaps at everything, very often at the paper and its policy. But the, they cannot read about somebody in the neighborhood building a church without being angry about it. They cannot read about someone else trying to integrate a school without being angry about it. They cannot read or study any dis development in art, science, literature, or anything else without being angry. Because all these things that happen some way step upon private toes, attitudes that we regard as essential to character. We are going to hold on to them. And anyone who differs from us gets the tirade. All of the thing is totally absurd. And yet this absurdity has broken homes and ruined lives for thousands of years. The answer to a large part of it is to wake up to the fact that other people have rights. That it is perfectly possible for us to live happily in a world in which there are people who are minding their own business in their own way and are making their own private mistakes. If, however, we are observant of our private mistakes, we will probably have little time to be overworried about others. Now, there is a point of helpfulness. There are times we read the newspaper and we see things and we hear about things and we hurt inside. There's no doubt about it. We're sorry. We're unhappy because we do not like to see people unhappy. 
We, do, we wish there was some way that common sense could be born in these people, that they would get over certain attitudes that are not right. We can feel very gently sorrowful, and we can try in every way that we know to equip ourselves to be helpful in any possible way that we can. But there's a great difference between a gentle analysis, a kindly thought, a wish that we could do good, a prayer for these people that they may do better, between this kind of a reaction and just plain hate or anger. There are many things in this world for which we can be sorrowful and a little regretful. But there are very few things that cannot be transmuted from anger to quiet, regretful acceptance if we are willing to face the facts. Face the facts that these people must grow by their own experience, not by ours, and that what may be good for us may not be good for them. And that regardless of whether it would be good for them or not, they cannot accept it. For at the same time, we are saying that other people are closed-minded. We are very likely the same way ourselves on something else. And no matter how sorrowful we are for others, there are others who are sorrowful for us, whether we know it or not. So there is a world of people separated by their own intensities, and these intensities must be reduced if they're ever going to get along together. So where things are not right, they are an inspiration to improvement, not a constant irritation. Once we begin to analyze the world in which we live, we are going inevitably in one of two directions. And if we're not very careful, we're going to an extreme. We're going to take the Pollyannaish outlook in which everything is better than it appears to be. And we're going to overlook all the faults and mistakes. We're going to forget many valuable guides and landmarks with the result that we probably will be ultimately thoroughly imposed upon. We're going to decline to take wisdom from observation. Everything has to be wonderful. This can lead us into a one kind of fool's paradise. It is one which, of course, depends a great deal of more imagination than some other extremes, because we have to have a tremendous um, internal capacity to overlook things in order not to observe that there are some rather serious problems that need attention. The other extreme is the individual who, looking out in the world, becomes more and more obsessed by sin, crime, and death. To this individual, everything is wrong. And wherever he picks up the paper, listens to the radio or anything else, he finds more evidence of it. He can become completely angry, or he can become completely helpless. He can become more and more neurotic and frustrated until his life is totally ruined. Once this habit comes over him, he will actually have skill in overlooking anything that appears to be right. And he will have no further balancing factor. There will be no optimism to balance his pessimism. He will therefore become either discouraged or belligerent. And both of these emotions are equally negative and useless. He must get behind all this and come to some basic sense of values. And somewhere within himself, he has to create a code of conviction that has some reasonable foundation. The universe is not all good and not all bad in action. The idealist knows that what we call the misery of living is due to man's failure 
to understand the laws governing his own conduct. Therefore, the answer lies in discovering these laws and applying them. Now, we are much concerned with the discovery of new laws, but we have done very little about applying the ones we already have. So a large part of our difficulty in society is that we are not living the code we already have. At the same time, we are looking for larger solutions. To, pick, to recognize this world as a place in which we are here to learn makes living important. But we will never learn by blind hatred or by antagonism, or by frustration, or by negation. We must learn by accepting the challenge of constructive thoughtfulness and emotional uh, integrity in the matter of daily problems. If we are really sincere, therefore, and really want to accomplish something, we must begin to look through things for their principles, establishing principles. Without some internal foundation in principles, we cannot accomplish anything. Now, in this world, we have two foundations on which to build. One of these foundations is emotional. And on this emotional foundation, we gain a great deal of insight from the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, where we are told that the highest form of the religious life for a Christian world is that we shall love our enemies. Now, this is considered to be, today, little short of madness. It is considered to be utterly impossible, inconceivable, and unrealistic. But it seems to me that we are living in an impossible and unrealistic situation for lack of it. We have neglected these ideals and the world and problem have become more difficult with every passing day. Today our psychological health is the worst it has ever been because we have tried to be practical. And out of being practical, which largely means to nurse our own desires, we have come to little, if anything. Actually, the only emotion that is safe in man is a positive emotion, an emotion of kindness, an emotion of regard, or of affection. And in some way, we must make this emotion real. Usually we fail to make it real because we cannot see that it is reacted to in proper terms. We are kind to someone who is unkind and they remain unkind. Therefore, we decide that the whole policy is wrong. We are not responsible for their action, but we remain to the bitter end responsible for our reaction to it regardless of what happens. And we are now putting thousands of persons every year into hospitalization for nervous breakdowns simply because the individual hasn't realized that he has to be right regardless of how other people are. So out of this situation, there is no solution because the other person doesn't react. That is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to meet a problem on a level that does not cause a psychosis for ourselves. And the only way in which we can meet a problem without penalty to ourselves is to meet it constructively. The moment we meet hate with hate, the moment we meet anger with anger, we're just two sick people. There is no solution. Each individual becomes a unit of destructiveness. And when we meet destruction with destruction, there is just more destruction. There is no answer 
in the form of neutralization in this kind of a situation. So regardless of the other person, our health and our integrity depends upon the principles by which we live. If, therefore, we want to be well, we'd better stop worrying about the people we think have injured us. We had better free ourselves from these antagonisms which will ultimately destroy all of the life that we live. And the more it destroys, the more we will dislike the person whom we think has destroyed it. But that person did not do it. We have done it to ourselves. So anger and these emotions have got to be in some way transmuted. We need emotional outlet, but it must be a constructive emotion. And instead of anger, we must have sympathy. We must have emotional understanding, tolerance, kindliness, and compassion. We must not only be less critical of others, but not even so critical of ourselves. There is no reason we should treat other people well and ourselves miserably. Therefore, we must recognize the natural imperfection in ourselves and by modesty get away from the necessity to defend a false perfection that we have never had. Most insults evaporate, and the insult, of course, is a cause of anger. Most insults evaporate if the individual does not overestimate himself. When someone tells us we're not quite perfect, this should not be a cause for indignation. We should face it as an inevitable fact. And if we do not face it, become angry, it's our own fault. Indignation arising from any form of truth only shows our own addiction to error. Most people believe today in a world of civil rights, a world of opportunities, a world of growth. We know there are many factors gravitating against the full expression of these better things, but we're still addicted to the belief that they are right. We also are quite convinced that the principles set forth in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, our Bill of Rights, and perhaps parts of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, that these are the heritage of our people, that they represent the patterns we want, we believe to be right. If, therefore, we believe in these freedoms, and these rightnesses, then we have to live accordingly. And we have to bestow upon others the right of individual initiative, the same right we demand for ourselves. And we must meet him on a level of fair and equitable relationship. We must realize that gradually this type of situation leads to the establishment of a merit system. That the only thing that counts in the long run is merit. And therefore, that our right to an enviable place in society does not depend upon our talking someone else down, but rather upon building up our own merit structure. <coughs> Excellence must arise from superior attainment and not from any false pressure within anything. If, therefore, we wish to be regarded as exceedingly admirable individuals, we must so merit this that it cannot be withheld. And if it is so merited, we will not have to defend it. Our emotional defenses are nearly always because we lack the thing we are trying to defend. We 
are trying to defend weaknesses so other people will not find them, failing to realize that they have already found them. Because the supreme weakness in man is the weakness of his conduct when compared to his conviction. Anger, therefore, is defensive. It is the individual trying to throw others off the scent when they are trying to find out exactly what he is. And in the anger, he tells them exactly what he is. <coughs> Removing all doubt. If then anger is a problem in our lives and we observe quickness of temper, the Pythagorean discipline might be very advantageous to us. Namely, that every time we are angry, as quickly as this mood strikes us, and as rapidly as we can gain rational control of it, that we should sit down and think it through. Think it through as carefully as we can, trying to discover, if possible, what the facts were. We shall then perhaps find out a number of other things about ourselves, one of which is hasty judgment. Or perhaps we have been over-influenced by opinions or words of others that have not been proven to be true. For many of the world's worst hatreds have been built upon gossiping and upon tale-bearing and upon extraordinary exaggeration and distortion of things. When we are suddenly angry, are we angry at a fact, at a certainty, or at a circumstance? Or are we merely angry at hearsay or something we have never thought through? Have we judged another person without trying to find out what his, his motives were? Perhaps he has merely poorly expressed himself. And out of this has committed a fault or, an, or a slight against us which he does not even realize he has done. Thinking these things through, we will probably be able to dismiss two-thirds of the causes of antagonism. Most of them will not stand 30 minutes of quiet reflection. Yet if we have permitted them to become an outbreak in our personality, a five-minute outbreak may damage our entire life and be carried to the grave. There are individuals who have ruined their careers, their homes, and everything with 20 minutes of uncontrolled emotion. Can we afford this? We can't afford it, but how economical are we willing to be? If then, by, re by a retrospective exercise, we sit down quietly and think through not only the occasion, but the pattern. Are we very likely to lose control under certain patterns, and what kind? We can live and love everybody except a certain type of person. Why? How is it that we can overlook the faults in our friends, but also we overlook the virtues in our enemies? What is the basis of this unreasonable lack of discrimination? Are there certain things in life about which we have prejudices so deep that the moment anything comes within the field of those prejudices, we are just totally irrational? If so, can we afford such prejudices? Can we afford their effect upon our families, upon our friends, upon our careers, and on our own health and life? We can smoke out some of these difficulties, bringing them out and rationalizing them, trying to exhaust their pressure in a reasonable manner. Now, a great many illusions or delusions can live only because of darkness. They cannot stand the light of fact. 
Consequently, we are continuously hiding them and keeping them away from the light. The worst and most negative attitudes that we have are the ones we protect the most. Even under analysis, we will try every way we can to hide them. We nurse them like a ghost in our house. And we are desperately afraid that they will be discovered. But most of these negative situations only continue because we have never factualized them. And we are taking what release we get through outbursts of emotion relating to them. Actually, we could also work these things out with the same energy or less. If we would, for instance, I know an individual who had such a powerful religious resentment against a certain organization that he really lost most of his religious personal standing in himself to this one prejudice. He could not escape from it, apparently. And yet he claimed to be a devout person, a devout person loving many other people moderately and hating one situation desperately to the degree that this hate practically devoured all his true and natural religious feelings. He did this for years, and this hate gradually worked in upon him until it became an obsession. Morning, noon, and night, he could talk about nothing else. And at the same time, he claimed to be an honorable religious person. Finally, it got so bad that he did go for counseling. It was pretty desperate. His entire life was falling apart. And the counselor said to him, Do you really know the thing that you dislike? Why do you dislike this particular religion? The man said, Well, to be perfectly frank with you, a person belonging to that religion did me the greatest injury I've ever known. Now, for most persons, that is enough. All dogs are like the dog that bites us, and that's it. But on this circumstance, which was utterly unreasonable, an entire life had been corrupted. Finally, the analyst was able to convince this individual that he could not judge all by one. And he convinced him that he should go for himself and find out about this religion. So gathering up his resources, and really at a tremendous example of heroism, he tried it, knowing before he got there that he was going to keep on hating it. But he stuck with it, and six months later joined it. <laughs> because he suddenly realized that he had never known anything about it. He had taken a personal feeling and made it completely synonymous with a group of persons. He had no actual concept of values. Now if by some chance three people belonging to that faith had injured him at some time during life, then an almost certainty would be a complete certainty. And still, there'd be no more truth in it than there would be if there was only one who did it. You cannot work this way. And yet most people do. And the result is they're miserable most of the time, usually over something that really hardly concerns them and about which they should have no such attitudes in the beginning. If we then take these problems and begin to break them down, what makes us angry? Most persons reporting it uh, in daily living, not in ex exceptional cases, but just the irritation, temper fit, anger business, most report that their real trouble is little things. They can handle the house burning down. They can handle major illness and six months of hospitalization without a flutter. But 
they cannot stand the fact that the husband slams the door every day when he comes in. This is the thing that really wears you down. A little pattern of mannerism becomes a desperate nuisance. A peculiarity of disposition, itself nothing, can become enlarged by morbid reaction to it until it becomes a tremendous problem. All kinds of little things moving in. We're busy with something, comes an interruption. This interruption is just one of 50 interruptions. And that's the final one that we just can't stand any longer. And out comes the temper fit. But most of the great problem, the grave problems of living, are these little things that nursed and nourished gradually accumulate until they produce a stress pattern, ultimately resulting in the individual losing control of his own emotions. And every time he lets go with his temper, it is easier to do it again. And in time, the temper becomes completely unruly. One thing, of course, that we have often observed in connection with these problems is that the individual who gets a lot of emotional stress is nearly always a person without enough action. There is not enough actual positive activity. Either the business is in a rut so that we think in only certain terms and have no room for imagination, or the home has become a routine structure in which there is too much time for imagination along negative lines. You will find less tendency for these powerful pressures in people who have a reasonably large social contact and have comparatively busy mental emotional lives. It's the person with too much time to think about himself that is nearly always the most sorry for himself and also the quickest to misinterpret or build up imaginary situations. The really busy person doesn't have time to settle down for 20 years of hating someone. It just takes too much energy and resource. But if this person gradually isolates himself from every other contact and begins to stew in his own hate, he will have time enough to make some terrible enemies before he gets through with his life. So it's activity, objective activity, the clarification of things, the opening up of life, so that there is not so many stagnant areas in the subconscious. If we can do this, it will help tremendously. And also, if we can gradually build up a positive regard for value, if we can always be sure that when we uh, criticize, that we also commend, that we search as earnestly for the good things as we do for those that are not good, and out of a gradual division due to such estimation, our intensity is frustrated. We find the individual has five faults and five virtues. Now what happens? Uh, we can't get too happy over his virtues because of his faults. We can't get too miserable over his faults because of his virtues. So we don't get very emotionally involved. But if we allow one pattern to exist at the total expense of the other, then we're all ready for a big emotional outburst of one kind or another. And this emotion is too exhausting of value. It takes away from us energy that we desperately need for the daily problem of living. So when anger begins to move in on you, Take refuge in your convictions as wisely and as lovingly as you can.
try to realize that if these convictions are not available and not strong enough, then they should be. And that you should not regard yourself as having sufficient religion or sufficient philosophy or to be highly advanced in these things unless they operate when you need them. An individual who is right all the time, miserable all the time, is an inconsistency impossible in nature. The only reason we're unhappy is because we are not right. And this does not necessarily mean that we are wrong in each point of argument, but that we are not right as persons. We have not the integration in ourselves that lives and lets live, that creates and sustains poise in our own lives. This we need, and without it, all of our other projects, which we highly value, will fail, or at least come to only partial success. Reflect upon uh, the momentary cause of anxiety. If possible, clarify it. Another reason for anger is fear, whether we know it or not. We are very often angry because we are timid and also because we lack the courage to clarify something. If we become inclined to be angry at a person, uh, it is perhaps easier to just tell them that we don't like them in a burst of emotion than it is to sit down with them quietly and try to find out why we don't like them. But by the time the temper fit is passed, the antagonism is mutual and we will never find out. So when something comes along by which a misunderstanding is possible, the wiser course is often to sit right down then and there and find out. Find out quietly before this thing has been allowed to develop in the imagination until it becomes a tremendous emotional pressure. If we think we've been wrong, go straight to the person and find out. Try and find out why they have acted the way they have. Perhaps they have misunderstood us. And most trouble is just lack of understanding. But by the time we have nursed this grievance in secret for a while, we can build it into a good lusty hate. Whereas if it had been clarified about the worst that might have happened would have been an apology or perhaps a separating of interest because we do not approve of certain ways. But having solved it, it is no longer a big emotional problem. In order to get emotional intensity behind things, we have to keep them secretively in ourselves. Once they come out, once they are generally disseminated and are applied to their directives, we do not have this intensity anymore. Therefore, a secret hate is the most terrible hate of all. And an anger moving from secret motives that we have never revealed and never faced can be the most terrible anger of all. So an insult as a source of anger is usually solved by the fact that we do have faults and we may as well face them. And even sometimes an insult is a reminder that we need and from which we can profit. Injury is always hard to carry and hard to bear. But there are very few persons, even those of the best intention, who have been able to go through life without themselves injuring someone. Even though they do not know it, they have probably done so. Therefore, injury is something that we all carry as a burden. Sometimes, however, hate is the most injuring thing of all. Anger can be a terrible injury because it not only is directed against a person but because of what it does to our disposition, it does a positive and dangerous hurt to many other people. 
the person who hates one individual is a poorer husband, a poorer father, and a poorer son to others. He is a poorer friend and a poorer business associate. Therefore, he will injure people himself by hating someone else. So when we think and are angry because another has injured us, how many people is our anger going to injure? I mentioned that to one individual. He said, let them take care of themselves. <laughs> he was perfectly happy to be a very serious victim of injury. But he had no feeling for the people who might be the victim of his injury. That was all different which shows how locked and closed minds can get. Now we are assuming at this time that nearly everyone in this world today wants to be a little happier than they are, wants to be better. And to do this, we've got to work with the simple problems of daily living. And we know that every philosophy and every religion that is worthwhile in nature has taught man to forgive his enemies, uh, to be kind to those who unjustly use him, and to be patient against the adversities of living. Now this may sound like a very negative code, but it is not. It is a conserving code. It is a code which, if practiced, will, able, will enable the person to accomplish more in all the other departments of his living, for he will not be wasting negative emotion. Such emotions as he has will be positive, and they will draw to him, and they will serve others because he possesses them. When he forgives his enemy, he becomes a better friend to others, a better parent, and a better associate throughout life. He has also more energy to give to his business, his home, and his social life. All these things are essentially necessary, for we should never waste energy in negative emotion. The only emotions that are valuable to society are friendliness, hope, faith, and love. Other emotions do us no good and others much harm. Therefore, by nature and by principle, if we are right-minded people, we do not practice them, these emotions which are negative. And if we observe ourselves a victim of them, we know that we are sick and we set to work to get well. And the one way that all of us can get well is to sit down quietly and be fair with the problems which now concern us. If we do not know what the problem is, study both sides of it. If we do not understand a person, get hold of that person, sit down and find out about them. Meet all things with action. And by so doing, get rid of pressure. And then by degrees, you will find that your religion and philosophy do come through and help because they are there in the background just as pressure is there. But until we make a conscious decision to stand for what is right, the strength of right in ourselves will not be immediately available. We must demand it. We must command it. We must prove that we want it by doing it. And the moment we do, the positive resources of our natures also become available and we can transform or transmute these negatives into positive values. And every person who is able to transmute a temper or to prevent a temper fit or to relax a pressure which causes indignation or hatred, every person who achieves this only once is a better person. And having achieved it once, he discovers how he can continue to achieve it. So make this effort, and even if you are generally a person of a good disposition, try to find out where the weak spots are which could tempt you to be unpleasant.
unpleasant or unhappy, and finding these things, go to work on them directly. Don't study the universal mysteries as they relate to something else, but take the law of our existence and apply it in this sensitive area until you find the principles and can make them acceptable to your consciousness. In this way, you will have a better and happier life. All right, time's up. Now, many folks are of the opinion that psychology began with Sigmund Freud, but that would be a considered an error. So next uh, Sunday morning, we're going to make a survey of 5,000 years of it, proving that nearly all those years were passed before dear old Dr. Freud came along. The only thing that is new about it is a certain type of name structure and a certain classification of already existing knowledge. Like all so-called new things, we are in the presence of new arrangements of eternal things. So next Sunday morning, we're going to study these a little bit, and we hope that you will all be here for the occasion and bring your friends. I'd like to announce that we really have an unusual wealth of situations uh, at the book table this morning. First of all, we have the new magazine on the table, the winter issue of Horizon which contains articles which you th we think you will enjoy, including a little story about the Honorable Mr. Nakamura. And on this occasion, Mr. Nakamura is playing Santa Claus. So we have the story under the heading, St. Nicholas Nakamura. And Mr. Nakamura's little Japanese stories are all based upon episodes and incidents that have come to my attention and the one in the Christmas issue of Horizon is one where I was present and saw it happen. And uh, it's the story of this little Japanese art dealer who plays Santa Claus. He's a good Buddhist, but that doesn't interfere with it in the slightest. So we think you'll enjoy the winter issue of Horizon. I'd like to also call to your attention that our book, Old Testament Wisdom, is on the table for the first time this morning. We feel like um, being sort of commended on this occasion because, say, of six months ago, we promised the delivery of this book on November 15th. And on November 15th, we started delivery. This is almost unheard of. <laughs> yes, we really think we do have a little applause coming to us. Also, the Christmas booklets are on the table, and don't forget Christmas shopping with our literature. You still have time enough to buy the book, read it yourself, and give it away, <laughs> thus accomplishing several virtues all at once. So we heartily recommend you to give this consideration. And also our pamphlet, Right Thinking, which I think would help you in connection with the morning's discussion. This afternoon at 2 o'clock at headquarters, our PRS... Central or Center Study Group will meet at 2 o'clock. It's at the corner of Los Feliz and Griffith Park Boulevard uh, at uh, 2 o'clock, and, and they will discuss together our talk this morning on anger. Now, there's a place where you can all go and get mad <laughs> or find out why you shouldn't. One of the great advantages of study group participation is that individuals learn how to listen. Learn how to get along with people who also have ideas. And learn to be patient if those ideas do not sound very good. Because in a few minutes, they can get up and express themselves, and their ideas won't sound any better to other folks. And this is a wonderful opportunity to practice the democracy of philosophy and religion to get to the point where we can grow through the suggestions of others, that we can find friendship without absolute conformity, and we can learn to understand and appreciate the real sincere desire of others to grow. And out of this growing respect for the inside of people, we will get over being irritated by the outside. 
It's the beginning of a much better philosophy of life. And thank you very much.